this alumni festival presentation that's coming to you from the clinical school. Um, this is the William Harvey Lecture Theatre here in the uh, clinical school and as you'll notice it's quite empty at the moment, something we've experienced during this time of COVID-19. We're going to talk to you this evening a bit about how we've been providing new doctors for the NHS during the time of COVID. So let me just briefly introduce our speakers. So there's four of us this evening. I'm going to start with Dr. Diana Wood, um, the Dean of the School, who's going to be talking a bit about the national perspective of COVID-19 and medical training. I'm going to then talk a little bit about the local curriculum changes we implemented. Dr. Jeremy Webb is going to talk a little bit about the staff development that we had to do in order to deliver that. And Nicola Jones is going to talk to us a bit about how our students then worked in the NHS, um, both as volunteers and as what's called FIYs, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that. So that's the plan for this evening. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to, uh, to Dr. Diana Wood, um, who's going to introduce a little bit about the national perspective. Well, hello, everybody. And I would just like to add my welcome to, to Mark's. Um, we're really pleased to be able to have the opportunity to be able to tell you about some of the things we've been up to in the last few months, which, of course, have not been uh, our normal summer term and summer run through. Uh, next slide, please. So some of you may have attended the alumni event last September, and I very proudly showed you these three photographs, the top one being the first clinical school intake in 1976, the middle one being my first clinical intake in 2003, and the bottom one is the 2017 clinical intake, and this was the first year that all the students who we'd taken into the undergraduate course in Cambridge were all taken into the clinical course. In other words, all of them stayed with us for the first six years. So this was rather an exciting cohort. And those of you who uh, have looked at that will notice that this is the photograph of the students who were due to qualify in 2020. Next one, please, Charlotte. And then this happened. And so we really have had rather a, a momentous year in medical education. And what we're going to be talking to you about in this session is really how we've tried to cope our best, not only with graduating students early, but also in, um, in developing the course very rapidly uh, to the situation in which we found ourselves. Next one, please. So taking you back to February, you may remember January, February, people were talking about coronavirus in a slightly different way. Uh, there was, you know, it's not a cold virus. It's just a cold virus, rather. It's very contagious, but not very harmful. And it's not like SARS or MERS. That was what we thought. And as you can see, uh, at that time, the only way that this was interfering in my life is that my parking space had been commandeered by Addenbrooke's. Uh, although I have to say we rather liked the idea that they've made it available for a virus to pull up in its Audi. Um, but they did put pods on the university parking, parking spaces and we thought that it would all be dealt with quite quickly. However, as we now know, that was not going to be the case. And by late February there was a pandemic and we were particularly affected by events in Italy. Our infection just diseases team here were in touch with colleagues in Italy and it really was extremely um, disturbing what was happening in northern Italy particularly in, in Bergamo and we had a talk from one of our infectious disease registrars in at the uh, in early March um, uh, he's actually an alumnus and he came and gave us what was really uh, a talk that made us all stop dead in our tracks and think what on earth are we going to do. So nationally it was clear that the UK was heading for major problems and if you remember there was real concern that the NHS would be overwhelmed. Next one please. So the first couple of weeks in March were extremely busy and uh, it was clear that we needed a, a, a national um, outlook on medical student education during this time. A medical schools council f formed a COVID group which first met rather auspiciously on Friday the 13th. Um, so I was part of this group which involved about six clinical deans or equivalent. Uh, it was co-chaired by the two co-chairs of medical school council 
and it also had representative from the GNC and from Health Education England. So this was a really useful um, group and it meant that we were here in Cambridge, we're always um, up, to, up to speed with what was going on nationally. So by that first meeting on Friday the 13th of March, it was clear that most of us had started to think about cancelling clinical placements. And in fact, as things turned out, cl clinical placements were cancelled in all medical schools from the 16th of March. There was significant pressure from the Department of Health and Social Care and the NHS for us to graduate our final year students early in order to support the NHS workforce. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that went in a moment. So what I'm going to focus on is the work that we've done, which was coordinated through this Medical Schools Council group, looking at finals exams, the interim foundation year one posts that Mark briefly mentioned, and also a little bit about some of our non-final year students and what they did as volunteers. And finally, a really big project that we did through the MSC COVID group was to share online learning materials across every medical school in the UK. Next one, please. Um, so <clears throat> we actually decided to graduate our students early on the Wednesday, the 11th of March. And this very rapidly got out, as you might expect. And uh, Cambridge allows doctors to graduate without passing exams. Is that was actually the headline in the online version of The Sun on uh, Friday the 13th of March uh, and I was bombarded as you might expect with people wanting to know what was going on. So this is an extract from an email that I wrote to a colleague in one of the London medical schools on the Sunday um, pointing out that our students had already done the written papers and the resets and I think the fact that we have split our finals exams now so that written papers are done in December and uh, the resets in February really saved our bacon. We would not have been able to do everything in the way we did if we didn't already know that the students had passed the knowledge based test. And the GMC by that stage confirmed that if universities were content and there were no FTP issues, then they would, pass, they would give them provisional early registration. And um, those of us who know Cambridge will recognise that emergency changes to the regulations uh, reflect just what a, set, what, what a chaotic uh, time that was. This does not happen very often in Cambridge. Uh, next one, please. <clears throat> so I must have spent all of Sunday, March the 15th, on emails when I looked back. And this was one really that just updated us to where we were on that Sunday. So by then we'd suspended all our clinical placements, except for the final year ones. Uh, but as, as, as I've just said, in fact, those were withdrawn the following day. Um, Mark Lillicrap's going to tell you about what we did with our online learning for our year four students, which we suddenly had to provide for the week of March the 16th. Uh, the year five clinical placements, I think of course, is the biggest headache because cohorts have each in, missed a specific specialty. So some have missed OBS and gynae, some have missed paediatrics, et cetera. And uh, Mark will tell you how we've done catch-up um, placements over the summer and the August and September to allow them to do those specialties before sitting their exams. We suspended the incoming elective program and we consulted our students about outgoing electives. And in fact, we all agreed that they had to be suspended also. And as you've heard, we canceled our final MB clinical exam components and decided to use alternative modes of assessment based on the previous performance. And as everybody on this call knows, Cambridge students sit a lot of exams. So we did have an awful lot of information about the students. So we felt confident that in this, um, unprecedented and crisis situation, we could accurately and realistically um, assess our students by other ways. And finally, I've just wanted to pay tribute to the Clinical Student Society. 
Um, they have been fantastic throughout the last few months. They have been constructive, they've been engaged, they've done amazing sort of rapid student surveys for me and for my team so that we've been able to find out exactly what the students view of things is very quickly. So I've been uh, once again very impressed by the energies of the Clinical Student Society. Next one please. So you probably all remember your Cambridge finals and I'm pretty sure none of them looked like this. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, this is a photograph of the deanery team and Dr Lillycrap and Dr Webb are on there. Uh, I'm not sure we were socially distancing in quite the way we, we would do it now, but that's how we were at that point in time. So we looked through every individual student file and the administration team had prepared um, a list of where students were missing placement sign-offs, hadn't submitted work, or had any outstanding fitness to practice issues. And we recorded all this on a front sheet and the front sheet is actually in the student file as part of the student record. Uh, so as a result of that process, we graduated 265 students at the beginning of April. Uh, that we had a couple of weeks where we, chase, we were chasing them up for late submitted work and so on and so forth. Uh, three had already fa failed the resits for the written papers, so we knew that they would have to repeat the final year. And we had one student with outstanding fitness to practice issues who actually decided to resit year six and is starting again uh, shortly. And if you want to get a feel for what it was like at the time, I've uh, put this uh, web link on the bottom, which uh, is how we reported this on the Cambridge University website. And there's also a link to the video that we made from the staff to the students as a congratulations for graduating. And uh, if, you, if you haven't watched it before, I know it was on the alumni website earlier in the year, but if you haven't watched it, do have a look because it's, it's quite good fun. And I think it represents that special relationship that we have in the clinical school with our students. Uh, next one, please, Charlotte. Just a little bit about interim FY1 posts. This is what happened to the majority of our students who graduated early. It was a national scheme organised by the Foundation Programme together with Health Education England, the GMC and Medical Schools Council. And in essence, they, the students um, started as Foundation Year One doctors early. They were paid. It was a proper job. Um, they entered the scheme from May the 1st. It did take a little bit of time to turn this around and particularly for the GMC to uh, work through the early provisional registration uh, regulations. To be honest, it was by that time a little bit late. We'd have preferred it if the students had been available a couple of weeks early. But they, um, I think it's fair to say that it was a very successful process. They went either to the foundation school where they would have been going in August anyway, or we sent them locally to our um, uh, teaching trusts where they would have had their final year apprenticeship block had, had all of this not happened. Crucially, they continued to receive medical school support, including access to the welfare team, and that we felt was absolutely vital. Um, we also ran a couple of Schwartz rounds during that time so that students being put in what was an incredibly st stressful situation still had access to the welfare support that they were familiar with. The national feedback for this programme has been excellent. It's being collated and I expect it will be published at some point in the not too distant future. Next one, please. Um, I think Nicola's going to tell you a bit about student volunteering. Students who weren't in the final year were offered the opportunity to volunteer and again the MSC COVID group produced guidelines um, for how to manage medical student volunteering and how to make sure that they were uh, supported and protected within what was a difficult situation. Uh, it's important to say that we also insisted that they were paid. Uh, so they volunteered to help and then we the trusts put them on the bank and paid them for volunteering. So it became a proper volunteer 
post rather than a, a, a rather than an unpaid one. And Nicola will be showing you some of the uh, real life things that they did. But this was a, a word cloud which we created from some of the first feedback that we had. And as you can see, I think what was really nice was the appreciation for nursing, um, because it's often difficult for medical students to understand uh, what nurses do. And so it was great that they were in as volunteers as part of the team. And they also obviously were able to practice their clinical skills, their communication skills, um, and their knowledge of critical care obviously went up a lot. Next one, please. So uh, the final thing just to mention, because this has, is having a knock-on effect, we still, we still have these materials. The other thing that we decided to do was to share the vast amount of online learning materials that, that each medical school has. And this was coordinated by my colleague Jane Norman in Bristol and by my successor, uh, Dr. Paul Wilkinson from Cambridge, and also um, through Amir Sam, who's the head of medical school at, Med at uh, Imperial. We distributed two packages to every medical school uh, at no cost. So Capsule is a case-based learning resource um, which was developed by Brighton and Sussex with a commercial partner who were, uh, and the agreement was made to waive the fee for 12 months. And Speaking Clinically is a fantastic video resource of patients discussing their problems, which Bristol developed and made available. Next one, please. So that's a quick run through what we did. As you can see, we also joined in Clap the Carers and Lighting Up the Buildings Blue. This is probably the most beautiful the clinical school building will ever look in its life. So it's rather a lovely photograph. And with that, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Mark Lillicrap, who is the clinical subdean for curriculum. He's going to tell you how we redesigned our teaching program. Okay, so I'm Mark Lillicrap. I'm the curriculum subdean here at the clinical school. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we redesigned our teaching program. Over the next 10 minutes, next slide, um, we're going to look at four key areas. We're going to look at the magnitude of the problem. Diana said Friday the 13th of March, moving into Monday the 16th of March. Um, what did we have to deal with at that stage? I'm going to look at the short term approach, which is largely about how we dealt with the knowledge problems in terms of how we deliver knowledge based teaching. And then the longer term approach, how do we deal with the practice? practical elements of learning and what have we as a team learned from this whole experience of coronavirus. So next slide please. So if, um, if any of you were with us last year at the Alumni Festival, you know we talked about how the clinical school works. It's a three-year program mapped to the outcomes for graduates from the GMC and our job over a three-year spiral curriculum is to move our students with fantastic understanding of the basic sciences from their three-year preclinical course to being exceptional doctors starting foundation programs normally um, at the start of August. So on the next slide, um, we're just to unpick what that spiral looks like. Again, revisiting stuff we talked about at last, week's, last year's Alumni Festival. Year four, basic foundational skills, developing basic understandings of the common problems you encounter clinically, patient journeys, clinical assessment, reasoning skills, professional identity formation, developing um, all of that during year four. In year five, we come back and we, re we then revisit that in areas of specialist practice, and we look about how to apply those skills, stretch those frameworks of thinking in a more complex um, specialty environment. And then in year six, we're looking at applying those skills in clinical practice, building up to starting foundation year. There's an apprenticeship and a ward craft program, um, so that by the time our students graduate, they've got a good idea as to how to be an effective, safe junior doctor and apply the skills they've learned over the three years in clinical practice using all that foundational scientific knowledge that they've uh, picked up over the years. So if I can move on to the next slide, we can divide that roughly into two broad areas. What the practical elements and the practical stuff is delivered all across East Anglia in GP practices, healthcare um, settings, as well as in NHS trusts like the ones illustrated here. So on the next slide, we've also got the theory elements. So we bring our students back from practical experiences for regular reviews in terms of their theoretical frameworks, looking at reasoning, looking at communication skills, looking at um, palliative care, 
pathology thinking. Um, all those kind of elements in terms of theory. The problem on the next slide is we do that a lot. And so we bring our students back regularly throughout the year for these um, theory-based sessions. So if we move on to the next slide, we have a problem. So March the 13th, we hit lockdown. Um, and we're now in a situation where, as Diane has highlighted, students have been withdrawn from clinical placement. Um, they're often either at home or, or in their colleges. They're not able to get to the, uh, the clinical school. So how did we go about dealing with that? So on the next slide, we had four sort of uh, five sort of key things that we uh, that we thought about. We uh, we removed, as um, Diana has highlighted, all students from the clinical environment. We moved all our lectures to remote-based teaching, largely using Zoom. Some regional hospitals use Teams. All theoretical teaching was removed moved to the remote environment, and we adopted this flipped classroom approach that Jeremy is going to tell you a little bit more about, and I'm going to touch on a little bit in a minute. And then we restructured the teaching activity. So essentially we pulled all of those teaching blocks forward in the year so that we delivered all of the knowledge-based um, elements up front so that we knew that as and when students could get back in the clinical environment, we could get them to focus on the practical stuff having then covered all the theory. So next slide. If we, in terms of what we mean by flipped classroom, conventional teaching, you de deliver the, the knowledge during your teaching session, your lecture, whatever, and then you get your students to reinforce that learning afterwards with a variety of other activities. In the flipped classroom model, you get them to do the theoretical stuff first. So you have to design e-learning resources, de design things that take place beforehand. And then during the session, you actually unpick their thinking with them. So that makes it much more interactive and that's quite important in remote teaching sessions. So you can introduce that interactive discussion during the session and then you use the after time in order to provide reflective activities to support the learning that's gone on during the session. Quite a lot of work normally takes quite a long time to set up next slide. So we had to do all of this at fairly short notice. What did that look like for the different years? Year six, the pressure was to graduate our students early. They were missing the wardcraft. They were missing their apprenticeship block. So we provided them with a two week program where we embedded all of the core elements that they were going to need in order to be safe on the ward um, in a couple of weeks time. So we, we designed this two week program with junior doctors delivering daily sessions, looking at how do you work in a clinical environment, their key tips on managing common infections, dealing with blood test abnormalities, dealing with IV fluids, we had some specialist stuff looking at practice, practical aspects of management and diagnosis of coronavirus. We did work with the London School of Tropical um, Medicine, um, introducing some of the epidemiology around COVID. So that our students were all set up um, so that they could graduate early and move into those FIY posts, um, which Nicola's going to tell you a bit more about in a minute. That was year six. Next slide. In year five, we had the problem they were doing four different specialty areas. So we pulled forward all of the knowledge-based delivery for those areas, used the same flipped classroom approach. Our faculty team were fantastic in terms of developing e-learning resources, small group discussions, um, using junior doctors, senior faculty to facilitate small group discussion, often on a weekly basis. They were doing their, their before activities with a variety of e-learning resources. The medical schools, councils ones were invaluable, particularly things like Capsule in helping with that. We got slightly lucky because the electives were cancelled. And so what that meant is that having delivered the knowledge up front, we had a block of time that we were able to use for the practical elements. Next slide. Year four was more complicated because they were earlier in their rotations. And so half the year had missed medicine, emergency care and general practice, half had missed surgery and some student selected research. We used the same model. We brought all of the teaching forward. We delivered all of the knowledge based year four outcomes um, up front using the same kind of flipped classroom approach. Um, so that by the time they were able to get back onto the uh, into clinical areas, we knew that they got those foundational core skills developed. Next slide. We had to come up with a longer term solution. We had to think about the practical elements. The words of William Osler, um, that sort of famous man of quotes, he who studies medicine without books sells an uncharted sea. So we'd managed to cover the charts. We'd introduced them to the knowledge framework. Next slide. But he who studies medicine without patients doesn't go to sea at all. And although it was great the way that all, all the faculty worked together, the way we used the medical schools council's resources, in order to learn medicine, you've got to see patients. And so we had to come up with a longer term solution that addressed the, the practical elements. So on the next slide, uh, this was complicated. So we had to come up 
with not one, not two, but three different plans because we didn't know when students were going to be back. We came up with plan A. Plan A presumed that we'd be able to get our students back on the wards in July, August. We'd be able to use the elective period for those year five going into year six students in order to do catch up clinical. Plan B was that they wouldn't be back until September, October um, because we didn't know what the situation was going to be. Plan C was that they weren't going to be back until the start of 2021. Fortunately, we got away with plan A. Our students came back into clinical environments um, back in July time. So on the next slide, so we delivered all the upfront um, theory. So now we focused on the catch up clinical blocks. And so the faculty have redesigned clinical blocks, which are pretty much uh, apprenticeship blocks. So you no longer, we no longer need to have the knowledge delivery. That's all been done up front. And so they're immersed in teams during the catch up blocks. It's been a bit of a challenge with all the requirements in terms of PPE, um, working with um, patients often who are quite fearful about having students back in the clinical environment. We've also had to restructure all of the year five and year six attachments because the, the student's year has been delayed by coronavirus, we've had to restructure all the learning outcomes for the uh, subsequent years. And I'm very grateful, um, if we go on to the next slide, for the fantastic work that's been done. Because what have we learned um, from this experience in terms of curriculum redesign? The first of which we have learned, like many of you will have done, an awful lot about remote teaching delivery. Um, we're sharing some of that in what we call lessons learned, and Jeremy's going to tell you a little bit more about that. But we're all getting much more comfortable with things like Zoom, talking to empty rooms and cameras, using um, things like Teams and how we can deal with remote teaching. We've learned that our students are a fantastic group. They have been incredibly accommodating. They've been incredibly supportive of everything we've been doing. They've been contributing to all our thinking. They've been guiding us in terms of how this will best help their learning. And they've got involved with volunteering. They've got involved with the FIY program. We've had fantastic faculty and we've, we're, we're very aware that our faculty have shown how they can respond very quickly to change. As Diana highlighted, we had to implement the Year 4 Knowledge Programme over a weekend. So Friday the 13th, we knew we weren't going to have students. By the Monday, we had to have a, uh, a, a teaching programme that was delivered remotely. And so I'm very grateful to the whole faculty who pulled together to make sure that that worked. They've been great experimenting with the new technology, doing things in different ways, and we've all learned from each other. And finally, we've got amazing administrators. The administrative burden that they have had to deal with, reorganizing everything, timetabling, sending out Zoom links, working with all the different faculty across the university and the NHS to make this work, and our IT team who have actually pulled out all the stops. They've worked pretty much seven days a week to make sure that we've got technology that will support this, um, to make sure, get approval for using Zoom in NHS Trust, um, enabling us to share confidential information over Zoom with appropriate information governance, et cetera. So we've learned an awful lot from this. And that's a brief overview of those, of the sort of four key areas um, around the curriculum change. In order to do this, we've got to have faculty and we've had to teach our faculty and help our faculty to develop the skills to do this. And I'm now going to hand over to Jeremy on the next slide, who's going to talk to you a little bit about how we've, uh, we've helped develop our faculty. Jeremy, over to you. Hello, so I'm Jeremy Webb and my background is in general practice, but I'm clinical subdean with the task of staff development. And that really is developing our teachers and we run uh, a number of programmes. Next slide. Um, uh, where we're particularly talking about today about how we have to adapt to this sort of picture where the lecture theatre that you can see on the left normally takes 90 people and uh, uh, is now only allowed to take 19 and also doing practical skills like teaching things like communication skills in a socially distant way which you can see in the picture on the right. Next slide please. So what were the issues? The issues for us were, as Mark and Diane have already talked about, the sudden withdrawal of access to seeing patients face to face for our undergraduates, our students being isolated at home, which was actually quite hard for a lot of them, uh, and us trying to teach some clinical medicine without real patients, the fact that we couldn't do any large group teaching, and initially uh, small group teaching was very restricted, and again it's still restricted and has to be socially distanced. And as Mark has pointed out, we had sort of short and long term problems. And the fact that most of us as clinical teachers were unfamiliar with online learning platforms uh, in February uh, and had to try and develop some way of delivering teaching by the middle of March as a mode of delivery. So there was a big learning curve for all of us. Next slide, please. We also have actually, we've talked about the 265 medical students we graduate. 
we've actually got uh, going on uh, a foundation program of 150 people a year uh, learning how to teach, which we were in the middle of running that course. Plus we have about another 100 on our master's level programs, which is the postgraduate certificate, uh, uh, diploma and master's, uh, which we were in the first year of running the master's, which is the final uh, program. So we run that jointly with the uh, Institute of Clinical Edu Continuing Education at Maddingley. So we had to think on the hop about how to deliver teaching materials there, how to review the process delivery, uh, and also how we were going to appoint and uh, uh, interview people for the following years. So uh, that was quite a big task as well. And interestingly enough, the demand for all of the courses has approximately doubled during COVID. Next slide, please. So what did we do? Um, this is a picture of me and one of my colleagues doing socially distanced uh, teaching on the Heath at West Suffolk Hospital, uh, where we were running our tutorials. But actually what we had to do was to provide regular teaching. Uh, so there was a degree of pastoral support for the students who were feeling very isolated and know what was going on. Um, we had to rapidly migrate teaching sessions from a face-to-face -to, -face to online format, as Mark has already talked about rapidly develop new and improved online resources. And the thing we've learned is that you can't just deliver your face-to-face -face teaching online. Uh, we reckon it probably takes a day to a day and a half to uh, adapt probably a couple of hours of teaching because you're having to think about how you're going to deliver things differently and what materials you're going to be putting up in advance. You've then got to try and share your experience and expertise and some people are much more able at doing this than others. And then develop and publicize a workable model uh, and then, of course, we are going to have to go back to face to face teaching. And that was another learning curve because you had to learn how to go back to teaching under new rules. So there's quite a lot to do. Next slide, please. So what did we do? We called uh, our foundation course on medical education, IFMI, Integrated Foundations of Medical Education. So we decided that we call this VME or Virtual Medical Education. Uh, and the idea was that we would try and share ideas and resources that we'd found uh, and make it available to all of our clinical teachers uh, throughout Addenbrooke's, the general practice and all of the trusts around. Um, try and engage people who are enthusiasts and share amongst local colleagues and also sharing nationally. And we're going to make this uh, material available nationally uh, as soon as possible. We're just getting it uploaded to a different platform because people don't have access to our MedEd platform unless they're registered and we also felt that actually we call this humility we make it uh, demonstrating humility because we very much were aware that we were not experts on how to do this and we as Mark said call this lessons learned next slide please uh, so what we do we created a uh, space on our uh, medical education uh, website uh, and we divided it in, into different teaching units uh, um, with an introduction and each of the teaching units is illustrated on the next slide. So we developed some teaching resources which were short videos with linked materials to look at before the session, modelling what we were trying to demonstrate uh, and what to look at for further information afterwards. And those resources were a combination of short reading material, materials and also some videos. And so we made uh, webinars and podcasts uh, and Zoom uh, recordings of each of us doing different things. So there's one on introduction on how to teach remotely, one on how to run a small group when you're teaching uh, remotely, which is something we do a lot of in Cambridge. Mark did a very nice one on how to run large groups. Uh, one of my colleagues, Anita Gibbons, uh, developed one on teaching in and using telephone and video consultations in secondary care. John Ferdinand from GP unit developed one on how to do that for the GPs in primary care. And finally, we've got uh, two more, one of which is not yet illustrated on here. One on how to use whiteboards in remote teaching rather than having a flip chart and another one for our professional skills teachers. And we're going to add to these. Uh, so if we move on. So as Mark has already said, these are all follow, we're trying to get people to follow the flipped classroom approach because what we've discovered is you cannot deliver as much quantity of content and information in a remote classroom as you can uh, uh, in a on a flipped classroom. So what you do is you set some people up with some 
instructions at home, either video, podcast, book, or point them to a website uh, and suggest that they look at that in advance. But what we do with that is also use what's called an advanced organizer. So we don't just say, look at this video, but it says, look at this video. And while you're looking at it, think about what the teacher is saying about uh, how X or Y might work and think about how it might apply to you. Which then means when you're working with the students in class, you can use the interactive features on things like Zoom uh, and Teams so you can run smaller groups of pairs and group discussions and so people can uh, move on to deeper understanding of concepts uh, and, and give them support as opposed to the traditional model which is on the right where it's much more instruction, student take notes and the teacher then gives assessment. The other thing we've had to do is to try and encourage people to start thinking about how they're going to reflect and keep a learning log of what they've been teaching. Move on to the next slide. So we've adapted uh, this into what we call the before, during and after model, which we are sort of is very simplistic. But if we move on to the next slide, I can illustrate what we've done with some of this. So on each of the units that we're using, so the one that's illustrated there, which you'll find difficult to read because of the print size, Mark has put up uh, before an introduction to what's going to be talked about. Uh, there's uh, some direction to some papers that we found which is, were produced fairly rapidly uh, nationally about re teaching remotely uh, and then any video material that we found that might be useful and, and then we've actually uploaded the video material and the slides and then following afterwards we've got materials which suggest that they go away and think about how they might apply this to their own teaching. So we're trying to model that in our uh, web pages. Can we move on please? So here are some of the things that we've done before this session. So we've uh, highlighted useful free access materials. We've added hyperlinks to video clips of other teachers remote teaching. And what's like with all the things with COVID we found is that we found amazing resources out there that we weren't aware of. And there's a lot out there that's not just for medical teachers, but there's a lot of amazing stuff for teachers uh, in everyday settings and really fascinating material that we can use. So we like to sort of dangle a little carrot and to give people something to um, make them interested in the topic. So a little video or a stimulating link. Uh, and the next slide, you'll see this is what one of the slides looks like. Move on again. So this one, you could look at this YouTube clip at your own leisure, but it's a, a short three minute video where they've interviewed uh, uh, lecturers in the University of Rochester in upstate New York talking about their reflections of having to adapt to teach remotely uh, and it's really fascinating the things they've come that they've come out of, that's come out of it uh, and the positive points they've that people have come out with after learning to move to remote teaching so these are the advanced organizers so you give some sort of information and then instructions to think about it and to try and point them in the right direction we do this also with student teaching and the feedback we've had from the students is they really like having the information in advance. They feel much better being prepared. You've got to not to overwhelm them and we try not to give them too much information to look at in advance. But we do point out that they will get more out of a session if they do look at the, the advanced organisers. Move on, please. Next one. Next one. So what do we try and get them to do? We talk to them about orientating the learners and being really clear about what you're going to be covering during the session and, and signposting that when you're moving to a different topic. Try and make them laugh, try and make them wonder, pose them some sort of provoking question or uh, as Diane has already talked about, the speaking clinically videos are really useful to demonstrate to the students, patients experience of having a particular condition or an illness or their treatment or we add a provocative statement and try and pique their curiosity. Next slide. We encourage the teachers to reduce content. Uh, my colleagues will be laughing at me because they said I had too many slides, so um, uh, we'll be moving on fairly quickly. So then think more about the process of delivery, making the intended learning outcomes much clearer, chunking up the information. So you give no more than nine or 10 minutes of information and then stop and give chance for the students to ask questions either in small groups uh, or using uh, auditory ways uh, or if uh, larger groups we use the chat a bit like we're going to do on this session. Building in time to interact and we've built in all sorts of different ways of interacting using things like polls uh, and uh, uh, surveys. 
and trying to encourage them to reflect and also to point to further sources of information and pointing out that we're not trying to teach them everything about a topic at, the, at one time. Uh, next slide. So these are things where we've been teaching people how to use audience participation. And this is something, if you're using, used to using Zoom, uh, it's quite a big learning curve to know how to work the techniques. So for instance, showing videos on Zoom is not as straightforward as you might think because you have to set up your computer so it shares the sound. Knowing how to use the breakout facility is also important. And those of us who've uh, had to do uh, big group sessions uh, suddenly without any preparation uh, find this difficult because you're the only person who can control things. So using the chat facility and also the challenge of using the whiteboards. Next slide, please. So then at the end, we want to try and summarize the main points, direct them to learning resources, encourage reflection and note taking before logging off. So we build in some reflection time as part of the learning session. So with an hour's teaching, there will be sort of five to 10 minutes at the end of the session, we, we will actually do a round and get people to ask questions and make notes and also request evaluation of how they're finding the sessions because we can only learn more lessons by finding out what the students have to say. Final slide, please. So uh, that's a little bit about what we've done so far. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Nicola Jones, who's a critical care lead at um, Papworth and also sub-dean for Papworth. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, Jeremy. So um, good evening, everybody. So just to finish up really and round off with some of the uh, things that the previous speakers have introduced. So as Jeremy said, I'm the clinical sub-dean at Royal Papworth and the clinical lead. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think this perhaps go back to a previous slide. Okay, so on to the next slide, it's absolutely fine. So um, we can make sure in the slide set, um, there's a slide showing the impact um, of COVID-19 on the east of England in terms of admissions to critical care. And over a four week period from the uh, middle uh, of March to a similar period in April, there are over 400 additional patients admitted to critical cares within the east of England with either um, COVID or suspected COVID. Um, here you can see uh, the data for my own hospital and my own unit um, and of those 400 patients uh, within the east of England over 100 of them were admitted uh, to Royal Pack with critical care. You can see here in the red and the orange. In addition to that, uh, over the course of uh, that four week period, we had to be able to provide services to patients presenting with other emergencies. So, for example, their heart attacks or aortic dissections. And here you can see in the green. Um, so this was an incredible um, ask in that our critical care capacity had to uh, increase by three or fourfold over this period. Um, next slide. Um, so just as uh, with the, the deanery and the faculty in terms of the enormous challenge of thinking how teaching could be delivered in different ways, we had to think how on earth could we deliver critical care with a very limited resource and to increase that by three or fourfold uh, almost overnight. Um, so what we uh, very quickly appreciated is that colleagues elsewhere in the hospital have really essential skills which could be put to uh, very good use within the critical care. Next slide. So rather than say that uh, no entry, don't come to our critical care, we said, please come and help us. Uh, you've got really valuable skills that we could uh, really uh, utilize right now. And we came up with various models of staff in the unit whereby existing members of the critical care team would work alongside staff that were redeployed from other areas of the hospital in order to be able to deliver um, care to these uh, large numbers of very critically ill patients. Next slide. So this provided a, a fantastic opportunity for our medical students to be involved in the Royal Papworth response to uh, COVID-19. And this largely took the uh, one of two ways. So firstly, um, in terms of the foundation interim year ones, uh, which Diana has um, mentioned. So next slide. 
We had uh, seven of the FYY1s uh, with us at Papworth and uh, the education team did a wonderful job at developing a bespoke induction and training package for them. So this consisted of the seven FYY1s being buddied up uh, with existing members of the FY team um, and really working supernumerary for the first five weeks. Um, and we delivered uh, an induction programme which covered some of the things that were uh, unique to the trust and we did this in a variety of ways, again thinking about the nuances of doing that in uh, the uh, sort of COVID safe uh, fashion. So there were small group tutorials, there was some low fidelity uh, sim, there were clinical skills, human factors and communication uh, practice um, that uh, was delivered to the uh, newly qualified doctors um, over the first week. And then they had a four week program where in addition we did some interactive case based uh, discussions, we did some virtual reality uh, training for them, as well as some high fidelity stimulation. And we delivered some teaching again about some of the specialist aspects of the uh, care we provide here in the trust. Next slide. I popped up here a, a timetable, don't expect you to see the details, but perhaps just to give you a sort of flavour of things. So along the top we have our uh, seven FYY1s um, whom were uh, placed either on the wards or within the ICU with their buddy. They have in the dark blue, you can see there at the top, their induction, and then you can see in the red further on through the course of the weeks, their teaching, and then in the pale blue, their shifts. So they work days, they work nights, they work weekends and bank holidays, um, just as the FY1s uh, were doing elsewhere within the trust. Um, next slide. In addition to the uh, newly graduated doctors and then being able to work alongside the um, FY1 or alongside the FYs, um, those students who wanted to volunteer could also take up the opportunity to become uh, medical student assistant practitioners. And I was absolutely overwhelmed at the response. We were inundated with uh, interested people and over 40 uh, students participated in this role. And this gave the uh, medical students the opportunity to work sort of alongside the bedside clinical team in terms of delivering uh, care to patients from repositioning the, to, um, them to helping prepare equipment and uh, medications, as well as assisting uh, with interventions. We of course made sure that they had appropriate induction and training and uh, were provided with the uh, protective equipment that was required and that they were supervised all times. Uh, next slide. So some pictures here and um, to show the teamwork in action with some of the existing members of our critical care team alongside uh, some of our junior doctors and our medical students. Um, and I think teamwork was one of the most important things uh, I think that we took away from the whole experience. Um, next slide. And I put up a word cloud here as Diana did earlier, and this is um, some evaluation from the FYY1s in terms of the training and uh, provision of uh, the support that was provided to them. So they found that that was excellent um, and it was a really sort of friendly um, and supportive team that they were uh, working alongside. Next slide. And just to finish up here, um, I can leave you to leave this in your read this in your own time. But some reflections of one of our um, medical students who took uh, part uh, in the assistant practitioner role, uh, reflecting on what a valuable opportunity it was um, to feel that they uh, had really contributed um, and made a difference during this really uh, important and we hope um, unprecedented time within um, medicine. Um, thank you. Next slide. So that's uh, how I was going to sort of round up on um, how we as a team have been involved in providing new doctors for the NHS at the uh, time of crisis in terms of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you to all of um, our contributors this evening. Um, we've got about 10 minutes or so for, for questions. Do use the Q&A function um, that's at the bottom. We'll endeavour to answer those questions as, uh, as we're going through. Um, I'll just pick up on one or two of them um, that, uh, that have been asked so far. So did our final year students miss out on any clinical learning by graduating early? And if so, how will that um, affect the quality of their practices, FY1? Um, doctors. I, I think the bottom line is no, they didn't really miss out on clinical learning our final years. Fortunately, because of where they were in the cycle, 
the, the challenge was they were about to sit their finals exams. Um, and so it was about graduating them. But actually what they were provided with, with the apprenticeship program over the two weeks and the FYY program that Nicola's described, actually more than compensated for what they might have missed out on in terms of year six clinical experiences. So not really for the, uh, for, for the year sixes, um, it was more the year fives and the year fours who missed out on clinical learning. And that's where we've been challenged to um, put together programs that, that pick up on the, the stuff that they've, uh, they've missed out on. Another question that, that we've been asked is what are the plans for 2021 and do you have to change how medical students are trained in future years? Um, I think we've learned an awful lot and we will change how we, uh, how we teach medical students and train them in, in future. Um, our plans for, for 2020 to 2021 um, in terms of our year four program is unchanged from previous years in terms of the clinical side, but we've restructured the, uh, the teaching program to be entirely remote and we're using all the um, faculty skills that, that Jeremy highlighted to you. Um, Diana, was there anything else you wanted to add about the plans for 2021? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. We're hoping to get them through. I think what my major nightmare earlier in the year was that we wouldn't be able to get the students back uh, now and that would push everything forwards and our, our year six and year five students are already doing shortened programs because they've had to do these catch-ups. So uh, they're, they are already looking at slightly reduced time on, on, on in each specialty so that would that was the major nightmare and what we have done again working nationally is we have now got um, a promise from the NHS that they will not send medical students home again it was it was actually quite interesting in terms of healthcare students the only students who were sent home in March were medical students and dental students and I have to say I'm very pleased we don't have a dental school because that has been the most difficult uh, to get students back into practice for, for all the obvious reasons. Um, so we now have our students have essential worker status so they can move around, they can go into hospitals, they are treated exactly like any other NHS worker and also they will not be sent home in the event of any future um, uh, lockdowns or overwhelming uh, admissions rates. Um, There's a question about the year four and Shall I just pick up on the um, admissions question, which is yeah, very so just the admissions question. Should we just read out the admissions questions? Um, so the, um, have we seen an increase or decrease in applications for students because of the coronavirus pandemic? And do we think that the current situation will have an impact on student numbers applying to study medicine in future years? So Diana, if you want to answer those, uh, those questions, um, uh, so the answer is that obviously um, our students had applied um, last year. The, um, uh, the main problem, as I'm sure everybody's aware, has been the um, interesting experience of the A-level results. Uh, and what we did about students who uh, were given... Um, were given uh, centre assessed grades, in other words, grades given by their schools. So the, the difficulty that we have is that the numbers are capped and we had more students holding an offer than there were places. Uh, and that put, that put us and, and every other medical school, there, there's about a thousand more um, students in the system holding offers this year than usual. So they're, they're, being, they're spread all over the country. We've all had to come up with a way of dealing with the increased numbers. And we have done that here by um, agreeing to take uh, just over 330 students into year one instead of our top um, quota of 313. So we've got about 17 extra students. It's going to be very difficult uh, in the... Um, pre-clinical courses, it's going to be very difficult teaching anatomy and doing all the practicals for those students. So the School of Biology teachers have been working very hard to work out ways that they're going to do that. We don't know, obviously, about next year's admission, application numbers, um, but I think we felt it was quite important not to disadvantage next year's applicants by having a whole load of people deferring from this year. 
So I think the answer is we don't know whether it's going to increase the applications. Jeremy. Just, sorry, Jeremy. Uh, just from the postgraduate uh, teaching things, it's amazing that the number of applicants has actually gone up by over 50%. So people who are qualified obviously regard teaching as something they want to be doing. So we were being overwhelmed. So we're doubling from uh, 44 to over 90 people on our postgraduate certificate. And I'm, I'm sure that the goodwill that's been shown towards the NHS and the Thursday claps has certainly increased the profile of NHS work. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if we see not only within medicine, but across nursing, dental, allied health professions applications um, for, for next year going up just because people are very aware of, uh, of the work the NHS does. So um, it'd be interesting to see going forwards. Uh, another question for the students in year four and year five who volunteered, um, did you find that after their volunteering they were more excited to go back into wards and hospitals in comparison to students that didn't go to do any volunteering my I suspect yes would be my answer although I'll be honest I think it's too early to say um, I don't know whether Nicola you've had more experience with the students actually who did the volunteering and whether you Diana have any additional comments on that Nicola over to you first thank you Mark and um, I've had obviously lots of interaction with the students who did volunteer so um, not so much for those that didn't as, as students are just coming back into practice but certainly for those that did I think it was an amazing opportunity to as Diana said to work so much closer with the nursing team and I think just have that sort of uh, hands-on experience of knowing what it's like to care for a patient and do simple things like put up fluids and uh, some of the practical things that perhaps as students or even as junior doctors they might not have the opportunity to um, and feel perhaps more directly involved in the patient care which I think has been really important to the students. I think that certainly the, that, that echoes the, the feedback from the volunteering scheme nationally and I think the other thing, um, the other thing that was very, very interesting is how um, Health Education England and the GMC really uh, were taken aback by how successful this scheme was. We did try to get Health Education England to uh, start paying our final year students for the last three months of their course and have everybody doing a, an interim FY1 going forwards. But needless to say, um, that, that, has, that has huge financial implications and, and almost certainly won't happen. But I think it will affect how we organise our apprenticeship blocks to make the most of the uh, feedback we've had from students who've done volunteering and, and interim FY1s. Excellent. Um, an, another question. How have you managed social distancing in surgical teaching, i.e. in, in theatre? And I think um, sort of three things, and I'll get Nicola to pick up a little bit on, uh, on, on this as well. Uh, the first of which is to highlight what, what Diana said is that our students are key workers. And so we've been able to work with the NHS Trust to allow them um, surgical experiences. Number two, the faculty have been fantastic in helping come up with innovative ways. Obviously, a lot of theatre work is divided into different scenario areas, de depending on the coronavirus risk. Patients are pre-screened um, for coronavirus. Um, and then the third thing is that our surgeons have been trying some innovative remote teaching using GoPro cameras. Um, so in theatre, they'll be using the GoPro camera. The students will be, uh, will be remote, and we've been doing that during the lockdown period. So they, those sort of three areas have been important. But Nicola, you're with your critical care hat on, you've been more involved in some of the sort of surgical teaching than I have as a physician. So Nicola, did you want to comment on that? No, just to reiterate everything you said, Mark, absolutely. We've used, um, we really had to think about what it is, what's the purpose of the student being in theatre? What are they trying to learn and how best can that be delivered? So some of that can be done actually better with the students remote, with something uh, image linked, with somebody maybe uh, who doesn't have any clinical responsibility, talking them through step by step what's actually happening during the operation, as opposed to the student being there reliant upon people who were also involved involved in the clinical care to be able to teach them um, things as they go along. And then for some things where we think it's really important for the students to actually be in theatre, and um, then again, in terms of the uh, social distancing, the students themselves will all have the relevant uh, equipment on, so surgical masks for the majority of procedures, um, and um, then full protection if there's um, the need to. And again, we think about whether it's uh, appropriate for students to be there at that point. So reiterating your thoughts, Mark. 
And so the, uh, we, we've got another question here that I'm going to hand over to Jeremy in a second. Will, will some of the positive parts of the online and um, flipped classroom, um, I'd probably describe it, um, it, it, be used in the future as part of the standard curriculum? A absolutely, yes. We've learned a huge amount from this. Our students have found some of the flipped classroom approach is incredibly helpful. Um, I don't think we'll go back to where we were. I think we've learned a huge amount about how adults learn in this kind of setting. We'll be doing more remote teaching. We'll be doing more pre-recorded e-learning. But Jeremy, did you want to add anything either from your, your sort of um, GP experience or the graduate course or your um, staff development experience? I think mainly from the graduate course. So I, I'm a graduate course tutor and certainly we're going to change all of our uh, uh, what we call index cases, which is where we deliver clinical material to the um, uh, two preclinical years on a weekly basis. We are doing all of them, changing all of those to flip classroom, basically based on student evaluation. They love it uh, and they, they really want us to move forward with it. And so we're rewriting all of those at the moment. And that will, I think, like lots of things with COVID, some good things have come out of it as well as all the awful things, uh, the things that we've wanted to do for years in developing online resources. So let's end on a positive note. Absolutely. So if we're, we're going to draw it to a close there, thank you for, thank you for joining us um, this evening. And um, we hope you've, you've found this interesting. You've, uh, we've, uh, we've certainly found it challenging. We've learned a huge amount from it. It's been recorded. So the Q&A and the presentations have, uh, have been recorded. Um, so it'll be available. It'll be uploaded. The details of that will be available um, from the Alumni Festival um, information. Um, we, uh, we're we're going to say goodbye. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, we enjoy your evenings. Um, if you've got other questions, if you're interested, um, do get in contact with the clinical school, particularly if you're interested in some of the learning resources that Jeremy has been highlighting. If you're a teacher and you're, you're interested in getting um, additional help and additional resources, then, uh, then do let us know. Thank you very much for your time.